Hello, my name is Dr. James Wilcox from the Department of Family Medicine, and today we will be discussing shoulder ultrasound. Objectives. First, we're going to talk about briefly physical exam, some terminology that's important to know, then we'll go over indications and some literature, talk about the proper positioning, and then look at some pathology slides. So first, rule number one when doing your musculoskeletal ultrasound, make sure you do a proper history and physical exam. Um, when you're doing a shoulder ultrasound, there are a lot of different structures that could be potentially causing the pain for your patient in their shoulder. So you want to make sure and first do a good thorough history and physical exam to know what exactly it is that you're going to be looking for with your musculoskeletal ultrasound. And lots of different tests, lots of special tests. I know we go over these in other areas of the curriculum, so I won't go into detail. Some of the tests here um, we go over thoroughly. Some of them um, are worth looking up um, in a textbook or an online video to be able to have a better idea of exactly what do you think is causing the um, pain in your patient's shoulder. A couple of terminology before we dive into the um, musculoskeletal ultrasound. First thing is anisotropy. So as we look at the middle of the PowerPoint slide here, the very bottom, we can see what a tendon looks like when you have the ultrasound probe completely perpendicular to the tendon. It's nice, bright, linear, looks like a cable. However, when you have the tendon off where it's not completely perpendicular, instead of the ultrasound waves hitting the tendon and bouncing back into the ultrasound to be assessed, as we see on the top picture in the middle here, the ultrasound waves are hitting the tendon and then bouncing away. They're not coming back to our ultrasound receiver. When that happens, you get this area of um, uh, dark. Uh, darkness looks like a bite that's bitten out of the rotator cuff. It's actually is what a rotator cuff tendon tear looks like on ultrasound. So make sure that when you are doing your ultrasound that you are bending, wagging the probe um, to be able to make sure that there's no anisotropy. This video here on the left is of a biceps tendon in cross section. And as I'm waving the probe back and forth, you can see that the circular bright tendon um, is becoming bright and dark based on the angle of the ultrasound. One other term that's important to know with musculoskeletal ultrasound is shadowing. Um, we often will get uh, hyperechoic um, structures that will shadow and make it difficult to see below them. Things like calcific tendinopathy or um, just bones will get in the way um, of being able to do a proper assessment. A lot of ultrasound machines will have a focal zone. It's great to try and optimize that focal zone and put whatever structure you're assessing in the middle with the focal zone focused on it. However, a lot of the handheld devices do not have a set focal zone. Um, rather, the middle of the screen is their focal zone. So you want to try and get whatever structure you're evaluating in the middle of the screen. And make sure to decrease the depth to eliminate um, artifact or structures that are deeper that aren't as important for your evaluation. For most of our musculoskeletal ultrasound, we'll be using high frequency or linear ultrasounds. Um, they have clearer pictures, the resolution's better, they just don't penetrate very deeply. Um, occasionally, I'll have a shoulder that um, has either a lot of muscle or a lot of adipose tissue, and I'll need to use a curvilinear probe um, that we often will use for the abdomen um, to be able to look deeper than four or five centimeters. Um, once you start getting about five or six centimeters deep, um, you'll want a curvilinear probe to be able to give you a better picture. Often I'll use the curvilinear probe in the posterior shoulder um, to be able to get kind of a wider view of the entire shoulder joint. 
So when will we do a shoulder ultrasound? Well, as you can see in this list, there are a lot of different indications for doing a complete and thorough shoulder ultrasound. We can see lots of different pathology, things like rotator cuff tears, biceps tendon tears. We can evaluate adhesive capsulitis, AC joint separations, fractures, um, slip rib syndrome, uh, paralabral cysts. We can use the ultrasound to guide different kinds of joint injections. We can use it to guide the, ultra, the uh, needle into the joint or we can use it to guide the needle into a bursa or right next to the tendon. Um, for purposes of this talk, we will focus on the rotator cuff tear um, as our very specific point of care ultrasound evaluation we will do for the shoulder. But just know if you're ordering a formal shoulder ultrasound, there's a lot of different things that can be evaluated and assessed with just shoulder ultrasound. So how good is a shoulder ultrasound? Well, it turns out that shoulder ultrasound um, with the systematic review and meta-analysis uh, published in 2020 showed that it was about 95% sensitive compared to MRI. Um, so when wanting to pick up a rotator cuff tear, a shoulder ultrasound is just as good as getting an MRI. Um, at picking up rotator cuff tears, especially full thickness large tears, but even small partial tendon tears are very easy to pick up with an ultrasound. Lots of other um, applications for shoulder ultrasound. Um, you can see the uh, sensitivity and specificities. Um, looking for labral tears in the shoulder, not as sensitive. Um, there's a lot of the labrum that's not able to be visualized well on the ultrasound. Um, but especially for using ultrasound guided joint injections, there's actually a very large difference um, when doing a joint injection with using an ultrasound compared to just doing landmark based. This is a free resource online um, that has kind of a step step-by-step -step process looking through lots of different joints. Um, it's worth taking a look. Um, and maybe downloading some of these PDF files. It's through the European Society of Musculoskeletal Radiology. So when evaluating for rotator cuff tear, you want to choose the musculoskeletal or the soft tissue preset. Do you want your marker dot to always be towards the patient's right or their head? You want to start home base is the biceps tendon or the bicipital groove. The subscapularis will be medial to that. Infraspinatus and teres minor will be lateral. And the supraspinatus will be superior to the bicipital groove, which is a U shape on the humerus with the biceps resting comfortably inside. The subscapularis tendon will be medial to this. You want to have your patient externally rotate their hand and that will bring the subscapularis tendon into view. The fibers will all be consistent and will have a bird's beak appearance. You want to evaluate this tendon all the way to the superior aspect and the inferior aspect, looking for any defects in the subscapularis tendon. Once you've evaluated it in long axis, you'll rotate your probe 90 degrees and evaluate the tendon in short axis. Again, looking for any large defects or tears in the tendon. Make sure to Continue to wag the probe because anisotropy can mistakenly look like a torn tendon. Once we've evaluated the subscapularis in its entirety, we'll turn back to a transverse view, find the bicipital groove again.
And then we will go laterally to find the infraspinatus. Infraspinatus is going to be lateral and superior. And again, when evaluating the inferior spinatus, we want to look at the inferior aspect all the way to the most anterior aspect, evaluating for any signs of tear or inconsistency within the rotator cuff tendon. And then we will turn the probe 90 degrees. And again, evaluate the tendon for any signs of tear or pathology. We'll have our patient put their hand on the back side of their hip. This brings the supraspinatus out from underneath the acromion, and we'll evaluate the supraspinatus on the anterior and superior part of the shoulder. And the supraspinatus, again, has that consistent bird's beak appearance with tendon fibers running in the similar fashion. We want to evaluate that tendon all the way until it disappears underneath the acromion. We want to look for any signs of incongruency. Look for any signs of tendon rupture or tear. Once we've evaluated the tendon in long axis, we'll turn the probe 90 degrees and evaluate the tendon in short axis. looking for any tears. And as you can see, it's very important to make sure to hold the ultrasound probe all the way down towards the neck of the probe during these musculoskeletal evaluations because there's a lot of gel. They can be very slippery. And um, you want to make sure to hold the ultrasound all the way down at the base. Sometimes it's even helpful to use two hands when holding the ultrasound while doing a musculoskeletal ultrasound evaluation. And here's just uh, some uh, images, um, graphic uh, images of what we just watched. Um, looking at the shoulder, this will be looking at the biceps tendon and short axis and then long axis. Just some additional views that you can look at in addition to the rotator cuff tendon. Do short axis um, here, long axis here. You should, corresponds with short axis and long axis here. You can slide down the shoulder and look at the pectoralis major tendon, which is attaching. This is the humerus right here. This is the pectoralis major tendon that's attaching to it. Um, so you can slide further down the shoulder to evaluate that structure as well. Additional structures we can look at in the shoulder. Um, this is looking at a transverse view. Um, we can look at the um, coracohumeral ligament. So the coracoid process is more medially. And you can look at the ligament, assess it for a thickening, um, which is um, often found in adhesive capsulitis, adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder. Um, this is what the subscapularis uh, looks like, long and short axis. That's what the patient's arm externally rotated. Um, with their elbow held in close to the body. We can also look at the AC joint at the very top of the shoulder with the ultrasound and transverse. And we'll see kind of this cartoon seagull look of the AC joint. Um, we can also evaluate the subacromial bursa. Um, 
and we can look at it in a dynamic fashion which is the power of ultrasound it's not a static image so you can have the patient um, abduct their shoulder and watch what happens if the um, supraspinatus bunches up or if there's any bursopathy that bunches up while doing the um, abduction of the shoulder we can also look at the shoulder posteriorly um, to look at the shoulder joint so this is going to be the humerus um, right here the posterior joint this is the glenoid right here this little triangle is the labrum of the shoulder this is the infraspinatus muscle going up over top of the shoulder in the posterior uh, area and then this is the deltoid on top of that this very small dark area this is the uh, glenohumeral joint um, we can watch dynamically as the humerus here rotates you can see the humerus rotating in the back of the shoulder. This is the small shoulder joint. There's the triangle of the labrum on top and the glenoid over here. You can also see, this is the lateral shoulder. You can see the infraspinatus on long axis and short axis as well. This is again an, another picture of the modified crass with the supraspinatus and long axis and short axis. So some pathology slides. This is what we're looking for with pathology in the rotator cuff so this is our rotator cuff tendon on top here's the humerus below it deltoid this black line right here this is um, a very small uh, bursitis so we see just a little bit of fluid inside the bursa um, which actually is really common to see when there is a rotator cuff tear or a labral tear some kind of pathology in pathology in the shoulder often will show up with fluid inside of the bursa maybe bleeding or ser serous fluid but this is our rotator cuff tendon you can see the white line of the humerus is a little bit irregular right here underneath the tendon and you also see this dark chunk missing out of the tendon so this is a partial tendon tear you can see some of the tendon tore off of the bone here which is why you get a little irregularity of the bone you can see this similar thing on this picture over here we have the deltoid muscle on top no bursa fluid here here's the supraspinatus tendon and there's the humerus and you can see the supraspinatus tendon has a very large anechoic missing area here and missing area here seems to be only kind of hanging on by just a little thread here um, on the on the shoulder so this is what a rotator cuff tendon is going to look like here's a video of the uh, rotator cuff tendon in short axis here so we can see like a little hole missing and then again same thing in long axis um, we see the irregularity on the bone and see that dark area of very small partial tendon tear We can also see pathology of the biceps tendon. So this is the biceps tendon and long axis. This is some fluid, some anechoic fluid below and a little bit above the biceps tendon. Um, this can be seen in biceps tendon pathology like biceps tendonitis, but you might also see it if there's a rotator cuff tear and you have a little bit of bleeding or fluid going down, um, usually it goes down the subacromial uh, bursa space on top of the biceps tendon um, so this will be um, what you would see this is the biceps tendon in long axis and here's a little bit of fluid on top of the biceps tendon there posteriorly uh, this is looking at the humerus this is the glenoid this is the glenohumeral joint posterior um, you might be able to see a little bit of fluid here's a sack of fluid this is the glenohumeral joint distended with an effusion inside of the uh, glenohumeral joint you can also tell the irregularity of the humerus it's very irregular in this video um, this patient has pretty severe glenohumeral joint arthritis so there's irregularity of the humerus um, and even a little bit of the glenoid as well thank you very much for watching this presentation on shoulder ultrasound specifically looking at rotator cuff tears